Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. Create to me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your spirit. Blessed be the Lord day by day, the God of our salvation, who bears our burdens. Let us listen to the Collect for the fifth Sunday in Lent as we pray. Most merciful God, by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you created humanity anew. May the power of his victorious cross transform those who turn in faith to him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the first reading. A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 16 to 21. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a whip. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give a drink to those my chosen people, the people whom I form for myself, so they might declare my praise. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost the case of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost the case of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God and Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our hymn is hymn number 438, O oh Jesus, I Have Promised. Would you please stand?
We find ourselves this morning at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, the friends of Jesus. They live in Bethany, which is near the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives is a huge hill directly across a valley from the walled city of Jerusalem. Everything at this juncture is in close proximity. The temple and the temple mount can be seen from the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is the place where Jesus will fetch his colt for the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. These folks at Bethany are among his dearest friends and this dinner that is put on for him takes place in just a week or so before the Passion where Jesus will enter Jerusalem on Palm Sunday where he'll have that sacred meal on the Passover with his disciples where he will face crucifixion on the Friday and resurrection on the Sunday. This home is conveniently located near all the significant events of the biblical narrative. 
Bethany is a significant town simply by its name. It occurs regularly in the Bible. The root of the word Bethany, Beth, means house. And we see the word Beth used in describing various locations that are famous for Jesus having visited. And so uh, usually whatever is attached to Beth gives the meaning to the name of house. So when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he was born in the house of bread. And when he visited the seaside fishing village of Bethsaida, he was in literally the town that is called the house of fish. And one famous location that occurs regularly in the Bible, the village or town of Bethel is the house of God. Bethel, El God. And now that he is in the house of Bethany, he is in the house of the afflicted. This must have been a location where the sick and the destitute and the poor were cared for, called the house of the afflicted. And it is appropriate to be the home place of his dear friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who are known for serving others. We have been to this home many times before now. By the time we reach it on this occasion, we were in this home when Jesus had another meal with Mary and Martha and Remember, Martha was doing all the work and all the cooking and all the cleaning while Mary sat and visited with Jesus. And Martha scolded Mary for not assisting her with the chores and the exercise of hospitality. But Mary was listening closely to the teachings of Jesus and, and devoted to him and her discipleship. And Jesus cautioned Martha by saying, Mary has the better part. This is also the location where his dear friend and beloved Lazarus died. And Jesus arrived too late to save him. But in one of our Lord's greatest miracles, Lazarus is raised from the dead and restored to his sisters, Mary and Martha. And Lazarus becomes symbolic of the new life and the new hope that is in Jesus. And now we have this occasion where just before his passion, our Lord gathers again and a dinner is thrown for him. Lazarus has now rejoined them at the table. Martha again is doing all the work. Nothing's changed. Any, anyone feeling sympathetic for Martha out there? being caught in the same circumstance. And this time, Jesus is with all his disciples and friends who are with him. They are gathered. Uh, remember that the Mount of Olives is not only situated across from Jerusalem, but below at the foot of the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane, where all the olive trees are and the garden is in place where Jesus will be arrested, where Peter will cut off the ear of the Roman soldier, and where Jesus prays in his passion that this cup might be taken from him and he might be spared the agony of the cross. And so against this backdrop, against all these events that are about to take place, Mary breaks open an obscene, stupid amount of perfume and oil made from nard, and it spills all over the limbs of Jesus to such excess that his limbs cannot absorb it, and she has to dry up the excess oil with her hair. And Judas, Judas who is present, scolds Mary and says, what a waste 
Do you know the money this could have raised to have fed the poor and you wasted pouring this oil on the legs of Jesus and on the floor and in your hair so that the house reeks of this perfume? What a waste. I'm among those, I don't think I'm unique in thinking that Judas is not all bad. I think he was sincere in his call to be a disciple. He was concerned for the well-being and welfare of Jesus, and he was mistaken in the notion that the ministry of Jesus would include an armed uprising that would overthrow their oppressors, and he was disappointed. And he had genuine concern for the poor and the needy. He was in the ministry of outreach. Even though Luke acknowledges that he may have had other motives in trying to protect this money and this income. And Jesus reprimands Judas for his scolding of Mary and he says, Mary understands what is taking place. She knows I am about to face my burial. And this perfume is in the tradition of anointing the dead. To cover the stench of those that have died and to sweeten the air and misery of grief. And Mary is anointing her king. Mary understands, Judas, what is about to take place. In this occasion, we should recognize that when Jesus visits his dearest friends in this way and in this story, he is visiting us. We are the characters in this story. We are the Mary and Martha's and Lazarus and Judas and other disciples that witnessed this event. Jesus, in a famous quotation in the Gospel of John, says, I call you servants no more, but I call you my friends. And in this symbolic visiting of his dearest friends, he is inviting us all to this dinner that is taking place and into the fellowship of this meal as his dearest friends. How do they represent us? Martha is engaged in the ministry of hospitality, just like the women of the ACW or the men of the BAC, or the greeters at the door at Sunday worship. Lazarus represents all of us who have had our lives transformed and our eyes open and have been given new hope and life in the gospel. Lazarus represents our own resurrection in faith. Mary and anointing Jesus is all those of us who minister in the church and serve the Lord with extravagance and abundance. Mary is the servers and the readers and the lay readers and the choristers and the soloists and the altar guild and all of us who participate in worship and pray. Mary represents worship at its best. And Judas, God love him, represents all those involved in the ministries of justice and global and community outreach. He represents those who are helping with food banks and offering shelter to the refugees from Ukraine or health care assistance and caregiving to those afflicted by COVID. Judas is not all bad. And Bethany, the house of the afflicted, represents all of us in need and where all these ministries and people intersect and are one. And Jesus has chosen his last days to be here to make a point.
There are hard choices we all face at such moments as they did, as what role we will play and what we will serve and who we will be. But what we learn from this story is that there is value in the world that goes beyond simple utilitarian value or simply regarding something as valuable only for its usefulness. There is intrinsic value as well as utilitarian value. When we look at a tree, we can see in that tree its value in terms of fuel, from logs, or shelter that can be created from housing and lumber. Or we can look at a tree and we can also appreciate it for its beauty, its strength, and the shelter it provides us from wind and sun. Not everything is valuable in terms of simply its practical use. Look at our church, the way it's adorned today. We are full of the trappings of what is sacred. Our furnishings are works of art. Our altar is a place that houses a sacred meal of bread and wine and memorial. Our stained glass tells the stories of the Word of God, <clears throat> our singing is the praise of God and the sharing of joy and the entering into prayer. None of these things in and of themselves feed the poor or help any cause of justice, but they do feed the faithful. They feed us who in turn are inspired to ministries of outreach and assistance, ministry that cares for those in the house of the afflicted. As William G. Carter writes in his famous book, Feasting on the Word, and reflecting on today's scripture reading, he writes, lots of extravagant gifts are put into the air where they soon evaporate. A soloist or musician or choir labors to prepare an intricate anthem or song, but three minutes later, it's gone. The preacher prepares a sermon, delivers it, but worship ends, and it is soon over, some of it being forgotten by the listeners. Mourners provide large arrangements of flowers to honor those whom they grieve, which soon die and wither away. Saints donate large sums of money for their congregations to spend, over which afterwards they have little control and sometimes less acknowledgement. Why do we do all this if it is such short-lived? We do it for love, knowing that there is lasting impact to these offerings that cannot always be seen or measured. They don't always have objective, measurable, quantifiable, observable results, but they have value. To Judas, many of these things were like a benefactor taking a hundred dollar bill and setting it on fire and reaping only the ash that's left in the tray. But not so with Jesus. The perfume he was anointed with represents the extravagance and the abundance of God's love, not the scarcity. And this is characteristic of wherever Jesus appears. Abundant wine appeared because of Jesus at the wedding feast of Cana. 5,000 were fed by the Sea of Galilee in the multiplication of loaves and fishes. 
fishing nets that had gone empty by the fishers of people that Jesus called were full at his presence. Abundance of food, abundance of wine, abundance of oil, abundance of worship, abundance of love. Through Jesus, we are taught that God is generous and faithful. So what does it all mean? This story of the house of the afflicted teaches us to look beyond the utilitarian value of life to its intrinsic value of what is true for us and how we are part of that story. And we have value, we have value beyond our usefulness. We are valued by God for who we are. We are appreciated for our beauty and our capacity to give and receive love. And for that, To experience that, we are soon to be called into the passion and cross of our Lord Jesus Christ.
the most reverend and dear mom, metropolitan bishop, and the people and the clergy of the ecclesiastical province of Ontario and in the Diocese of Toronto, Anglican Deanery, we pray for our bishops Andrew, Kevin, and Priscilla, for our priest, Archdeacon Bill, and for the people of our parish and all faith communities as we seek to know Christ and to make him known. We pray to you, Lord, Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy, for the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray to you, Lord, Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy, for peace in the world, that a spirit of respect and reconciliation may grow among nations and peoples, especially praying for those who suffer in Ukraine. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, especially Marie Barker, Jill, Janice, Paul Baxter, Thelma Martin, Linda Reed, Jerry, Steve Addersley, Wendy Watson, Andrew Stainland, Russ Matthews, Bert Virgin, Infant Levi Robert McTaggart, Alexander, Joan Bolton, Nancy, Doug, and all who suffer, especially remembering those in Ukraine who have died, their bereaved families, and those who are refugees, prisoners, and all in danger, that they may be relieved and protected. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For grace to amend our lives and to further the reign of God, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. 